Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Friday the 13th, the so-called final chapter. By 1984, the slasher subgenre was waning, after countless bloody low-budget affairs had flooded the horror market. Though the Friday films were profitable, they weren't respected by non-horror fans. The disparagement was starting to weigh on producer Frank Mancuso Jr., who decided to end the series so he could pursue other projects. I really want to bring this thing to a, an effective close. You may remember Frank Mancuso Sr. from the first Friday recount. He was the Paramount executive who helped get the original film released. His son, Frank Jr., started working on the Friday sets during part two, first as a production assistant, but quickly becoming a producer by time part three rolled around. Mancuso was the closest thing to a showrunner the Friday franchise ever had, which might explain why the first four feel so samesy. He called them exercises in commerce. They were there to make money, not to be art. Steve Miner declined to direct another installment, so Mancuso hired Joseph Zito to helm the final chapter, which would again be shot in Southern California. Zito was suggested by Boston money man Phil Scuderi because of his 1981 film The Prowler, which I covered in the first Kill Count filmed at my new house. Zito studied the first three Fridays to make sure he'd give the fans what they wanted, and tried his best to do new things within the restrictions of the Friday formula, which was mandated by the producers and investors. From my research, Zito seems like he was an intentional, intelligent director who truly wanted to make the best Friday film he could. However, he was also a demanding perfectionist, and his quote-unquote tough love eventually led to conflict with some of his cast, even though they were just as serious about making the film. We all just wanted to make it as good as we could make it. Zito hired Barney Cohen to quickly write a script, and together they tried to make their teenage victims more empathetic and real. These kids are certainly more believable as a group of friends than in part three, where the stoners stick out like a head waiting to be decapitated, but in the end, they're still just young, attractive teens who visit Crystal Lake wanting to have sex. And boy, do they want to have sex. You think Chris Higgins' friends were bad? Sex, sex, sex. You guys are getting boring, you know that? Nah, these teens do nothing but talk about fucking. This is the horniest Friday the 13th by far. Take away that camp counselor job, and there's nothing for them to do but be horny. It's a little exhausting. Shaking things up is the presence of the Jarvis family. Mama Tracy, older sister Trish, and younger brother Tommy, played by a 12-year-old Corey Feldman at the beginning of his career. Feldman would be one of the biggest child stars of the 80s before his career was upended by a troubled personal life, which saw him as both a victim and an abuser. That's all I can say about that here. The character Tommy Jarvis is one of Friday's greatest assets. He'll have his own trilogy, kick some serious ass, and wear a bomber jacket like a motherfucker. He's a great foil for Jason Voorhees, and his story begins here, as an adolescent who happens to wind up getting too close to horny teens. Sucks for him, man. Jason's like a magnet to horny teens, and that little bastard is sitting on an iron mine. YouTube tends to get antsy about so much TNA, so let me cover my A with a sponsor for today's episode. Raycon earbuds are an excellent way to deliver amazing sound into your ear holes at half the price of other premium audio brands. Chelsea and I literally use them every day, whether it's to listen to podcasts while cleaning the house, to listen to music while working out, or to listen to relaxing soundscapes while zoning out and petting our little Lucy cat. Damn fine way to relax right there. Especially since Raycons come with various gel tips for your comfort, and don't stick out of your ears like some other brands. Raycons have a 32-hour battery life, meaning I can use them for all the long phone calls I have to do while handling business! They've also got a 45-day happiness guarantee Tea, so you've really got nothing to lose. Try them for 15% off today by going to buyraycon.com slash dead meat. That's buyraycon.com slash dead meat for 15% off your order today. When I originally ranked the Friday franchise, I put the final chapter as my number one, saying it was the best version of the first four films. I've changed my opinion, and this movie would probably be more in the middle now. As much as I enjoy Crispin Glover's dance moves, most of the characters aren't all that memorable. The kills, on the other hand? Well, to end and Jason once and for all, Zito brought in the man who did effects for him on The Prowler, Tom Savini, who personally designed Little Swamp Boy Jason. I created the monster, and I get the kill. Let's see what Gore Daddy brought home for this false finale and get to the kills. 
The movie begins with a previously on delivered to us by Paul Holt. Paul Holt! I mean, this movie did come out nearly two whole years after part three. Better remind people of all the stuff they've seen before. I love when it shows Vicky's death as though Paul Holt is talking about it, even though she's sitting right next to him. Thankfully, it's less than three minutes until we get our title card! Wait, title card! Yo, behind you! Oh god, it's the final chapter! With a pyro entrance, and surely some inventive opening credits. <laughs> Never mind, back to basics. At least for this one, Harry Manfredini wrote new music. Part 3 mostly recycled its score from the first two films, but here Manfredini's adding a lot, like with these horns. Sounding like a bomb song and shit. We come out of the opening credits into a fucking budget. Check out that whirly bird. And this opening shot, which was the last thing filmed for the movie. It was done by having a steady cam operator standing on a crane, which was then lowered to the ground so he could step off and continue the shot. The shot ends in the barn where the J-Man lies, right where Chris Higgins left him. The cops on the scene confirm my kill counting for part three. This time he got seven kids and three bikers. Yep, that's exactly what I got. This time they got him. Oh, except for that. Might want to hold off there. Jason's supposedly dead body is taken to the hospital where, what, is that meant to be Chris Higgins with her parents there? Okay. In the morgue, Mortician Axel does that whole eat around dead bodies thing that horror movie coroners always seem to do. Axel's a nasty mother fackler too, talking about a dead girl he says is cute. Real cute girl. Was. Well, she still is. All you gotta do is talk. go over there and take off your Nice pants. talk. Real nice talk. As much as Axel's into dead chicks and weird aerobics porn, his preferred outlet for horniness is Nurse Morgan. Nurse R. Morgan, I believe in a reference to Robbie Morgan, who played Annie, one of the first victims of the series. But keep it in your pants for a mo there, Axel. Morgan wants to give us this movie's daily Jason News update. You know, I make fun of the recaps and everything, but I appreciate that this franchise, right from the beginning, is committed to its own history even if it gets details wrong sometimes. Axel and Morgan are just about to get busy playing doctor when Jason's hand joins the fun and provokes a passionate sermon. Jesus Christmas! Holy Jesus God damn! Holy Jesus jumping Christmas shit! Amen. Axel puts Jason in an icebox without seeing the breath coming from the so-called corpse. As soon as he's back to his spandex banking, Jason comes from behind and murders him with a bone saw. And y'all, he twists the head around. Savini's back, bitches! For this kill, they used a medical saw with a semicircle cutout pressed against actor Bruce Mahler's neck. Mahler would have to struggle, but not so much as to give it away, while blood was pumped in from behind the saw. Though a dummy was made for the kill, I don't think the final cut uses it, since that last shot simply has Mahler turned around with a false body facing forward. Jason wastes no time killing Nurse Morgan next, grabbing her by the neck and pinning her up against the wall, then slitting open her torso with a scalpel. Goddamn! Originally, this kill would have had blood dripping down the nurse's leg, but the tube came loose and made it look like she was peeing blood instead. That sounds like less of a Jason problem and more of a kidney stone thing. For the final chapter, Jason was played by Ted motherfucking White. Ted White is very possibly my favorite Jason Voorhees. Dude was 57 when he played the J-Man, having already done stunts for decades, doubling for actors like John Wayne, Clark Gable, and Rock Hudson. This Texas-bred badass stayed in character and kept to himself on set, but at the same time took great care to keep his inexperienced younger co-star safe. The young people we had in the cast were some of the greatest kids that I've ever worked with, and I've worked with a lot of young kids in the business. Just unbelievable what they went through for the amount of money they were making. White's Jason moves faster than Part 3's hunched over loafer played by Richard Brooker. He also feels more intelligent than the trapped animal Brooker sometimes seemed like. Well, I did change it. I, I changed it to where I moved faster and uh, I tried to make the kills a little swifter. White didn't care about matching the previous guys. He didn't even want the job in the first place and only took it for the money. As per his request, his name wasn't included in the credits. He came to love his part in the series though and still attends conventions, where he often jokes about how old he is since now he's 95. Talk to him if you get the chance to. The dude is an absolute delight. I just wanted to ask you what your favorite stunt in the final chapter was. Getting paid. 
<laughs> now, remember when I said you'll see a whole lot of camps and houses around Crystal Lake? Well, I guess this whole time, the Jarvis family has lived there. Fitness-oriented mother and daughter, Tracy and Trish, and their alien son brother! Haha, <laughs> no, that's a person. It's Tommy Jarvis. He made this mask. <laughs> Which, like, I call bullshit. I don't care how smart and nerdy you are, you ain't making these things at 12. But Tommy Jarvis is named after Tom Savini, so of course he'd be a master at effects. Director Joe Zito thought a kid character would be new and interesting, and though he was worried Corey Feldman might be too small, Feldman won him over with how much he wanted the role. They couldn't contain him. His agents were trying to negotiate, but you know, Corey kept saying, oh, I'm gonna do this, I wanna do this, I'll do whatever I have to do. So, you know, it, it sort of hurt their position. There's a house next door to the Jarvises, which has just been rented by six friends on their way there now. The friends are Crispin Glover, his sex pest bro, and, uh, these four. Crispin Glover as Jimmy and Lawrence Monison as Ted are given the most screen time, as well as a running bit that revolves around Jimmy's little Jimmy. You're a dead fuck. What? A dead fuck? A lousy lay. A wilted bee stem. You know, you know. God, I'm 40. We know, we know. And if you like the dead fuck joke, well, you're in great luck, folk. Dead fuck. Dead fuck. He thinks that's funny. He thinks that's a funny thing he's doing. He certainly does. On their way to the lake house, the kids pass the roadside grave of Mrs. Voorhees. This tombstone is the first time we learn her first name was Pamela. She was only known as Mrs. Voorhees for the first three films. The horny wagon also passes by a hitchhiker who has no lines but does get to eat a banana. That's free crafty. I love bananas. Me too. Before she can get herself all that potassium, though, Jason comes up and stabs her through the neck. Jason was played by Tom Savini here, so I'm holding him accountable for the murder of this banana. This kill was done in broad daylight, which meant they couldn't hide the makeup effects in the dark. A flexible metal blade was curved around actor Bonnie Hellman's neck and then pushed through a latex neck cover while blood was pumped through a tube. In post-production, they color-treated the film to better match the latex to the real skin. The kids arrive at their house after dark, interrupting this Jarvis sandwich next door. Trish, Tommy, and their good boy Gordon go next door to meet the kids as Mama Jarvis stares menacingly through the window. This kind of works as a nod to Mrs. Voorhees. Or, I'm sorry, a nod to Pamela. But of course Tracy's gonna be disapproving of these kids. The Hornsters are giving free peep shows to Tommy, who reacts in the most believably excited adolescent way. Like I said, this movie's horny as hell. So let's bring in more chicks to get naked and have sex. Twins Tina and Terry, played by English identical twins, Kamala and Carrie Moore, who at one point had been Doublemint twins, but I can't track down their commercial. They joined most of the cast getting naked for a group skinny dipping scene. Some of the male actors went bottomless out of solidarity for their topless and also bottomless female co-stars. Tommy ends up getting an eyeful of this flesh party, further jumpstarting this kid's hormones and revving that puberty engine up. In real life, that's also exactly what was happening. I get to do scenes with boobies. Not much has changed. <laughs> he jokes about it there, but I'm kind of sad Feldman was exposed to and surrounded by this stuff at this early age, especially since he was going through some serious family issues at the time. The 12-year-old Feldman didn't think of himself as a kid and constantly wanted to hang out with the older cast members. Kimberly Beck, who plays his sister Trish, had experience as a child actor, so she took to being a big sister to Feldman in real life too. She even took him trick-or-treating on Halloween, the first day of production, during which they saw plenty of Jason roaming around. Trisha's car breaks down so bad that not even Tommy can fix it. And that kid's a boy genius! Remember the mask? Instead, they're helped by a suspicious camper guy named Rob. His small talk is just a fucking parade of red flags. I didn't think anyone lived this deep in the woods. We do. Is there any kids, vacationers, people like that? Yeah, uh bunch of kids moved in yesterday. Trish, this is the 1980s. By now, people know about serial killers. Be more careful. That means don't bring this guy inside your house and let him go into the 12-year-old's room. <laughs> nah, I'm just playing. Rob's cool enough, I guess. Sure, let him camp out in the woods outside your home. Whatever. Next door, the kids are engaging in ritualistic mating behaviors, including a dance that Crispin Glover came up with on his own. He reportedly would dance this way in clubs around LA, and it was so fucking weird the other actors couldn't stay in character during the first take they did. We lost the first take because people were just so astounded by how it looked. Glover was picked by Zito because of how unique he was and kept mostly to himself on set, always the brooding artist. His career would really take off the following year with Back to the Future, which also featured a small appearance by Lisa Freeman, who played Nurse Morgan. Samantha, whose character is likes to have the sex, is dating this doofus Paul who's in the running for most forgettable character of the franchise. Shitty boyfriend too. He ditched 
ditches Sam for Tina the twin. You don't mind, do you? Actually, I was thinking about taking a little swim. Yo, a swim? That can only mean one thing in a movie this horny. A totally senseless skinny dipping scene! And this one's not only gratuitous, it was also negligent. It wasn't filmed as a closed set, so the entire crew was there, all standing around as 19-year-old actor Judy Aronson got naked. Co-star Barbara Howard says it was not done in a protective, sensitive way. Samantha spent some freezing moments by herself in a raft in the lake, and is killed when Jason pops up out of the water to stab her in the funny organ. <laughs> so-called because of the noise you make when you're stabbed there. Shooting this kill resulted in the movie's most infamous production tale. What she had to go through, but you know, all naked on a raft. Filmed in December 1983, halfway through the 12-week shoot that was supposed to only be six, Judy Aronson had to submerge herself in the cold water of the Franklin Canyon Reservoir. In a wetsuit from her waist down, she had her upper body through a hole in the raft. The blade would go through a fake torso behind her, its seam covered up by her hair. This took hours to arrange, and the scene was filmed from sundown to sun up. There were points where I just felt like I couldn't go on anymore. They said, no, we have to finish, we have to finish. Despite repeated requests, Zito wouldn't allow Aronson out of the water until Ted White threatened to quit the shoot if they didn't stop and warm her up. After that, the director and the Jason actor were on tense terms, while Judy Aronson got hypothermia and was sick for days. I love that White fought for her safety here, and though he once called Zito a bully who treated his actors like dirt, he's also judicious about the director's intentions. Joe, of course, was not trying to be mean. Uh, he was trying to get a film made. Uh, whether he was going a little too far with somebody else's feelings, uh, I would say yes. Back at the cabin, Sam's boyfriend Paul finally starts to feel guilty for taking some double mint delight. He heads out to find his gal and ends up stripping down to swim, except unlike her, he doesn't get all the way naked. Hmm. After seeing her dead, he does get a death that's more painful on screen. Jason stabs him in the groin with a harpoon gun and pulls the trigger. What a sight that is. Actor Alan Hayes was suspended on a wire system for this kill, which they didn't necessarily get the hang of right away. With Paul gone, Tina needs another source of vitamin D. And this chick is so horny, she'll hook up with Jimmy, despite bearing witness to those dance moves. Notably, she is not so horny that she'll settle for Ted. Probably because earlier, that creep was grabbing her by the neck and shit. Oh man, and look at Terry after Tina takes Jimmy upstairs. A face of total resignation at the fact that she's stuck with his asshole now. That is just the saddest sit-down I've ever seen. Can you prove her wrong and behave any better, Ted? Want to give Teddy Bear a kiss? Come on, dude, she definitely heard you say that to her sister already. Want to give Teddy Bear a kiss? You're so bad at this, Ted. Ted eventually finds some ye oldie time porn, and while he fixates on that, Jimmy gets the real deal upstairs with Tina. Terry's tired of all this bullshit and would like to please go home now, please, but Tina says to leave without her, so Terry heads out in the rain by herself. There, Jason spears her during a lightning flash in one of the best and most creative off-screen kills I've ever seen. Unlike the next one that happens, with poor Mama Jarvis, after she gets home to find that her kids aren't there. She looks for them inside and outside the house, and is killed off screen with a look of terror on her face. Originally, we would have seen more of Tracy Jarvis's death in an ending pitched by producer Frank Mancuso Jr. and money man Phil Scuderi. The morning after everything ended, Trish would go upstairs and find her mom's dead body in the tub. The nightmare would then be revealed as a full-on hallucination. Really glad they didn't use that. This series did not need a fourth dream sequence ending. Trish and Tommy get back home to find their house deserted and dark. Trish heads out in the pouring rain in an oversized men's shirt wrapped in a belt, looking for the tent camp and hitchhiker man she met earlier that day. Oh, there he is. What the hell are you doing here? What are you trying to do, kill me? I mean, in most cases, yes, Trish. That's exactly what he'd be doing. You've gotta be more careful. Rob reveals his backstory, which is another strand of continuity for these films. He's here hunting Jason because he killed his younger sister, Sandra. She's not shown in a flashback, but Sandra was the underage chick in part two who got impaled in bed with a spear. I love this stupid, needless connection connection so much, I don't even care that it doesn't make sense timeline-wise. Rob likely wouldn't know his sister was dead, or have time to start hunting Jason. Sandra was killed on Friday the 13th, Jason had his 3D adventure on Saturday the 14th, and the final chapter immediately follows part 3, making today, Sunday the 15th, only two days after Sandra was killed. Parts 2, 3, and 4 take place over a single weekend. I feel like a lot of people don't realize that. With his lovemaking complete, Jimmy puts a period on his character arc 
Wish I had dead. Fuck. Tina says, nah, they kiss real gross for too long. Oh, way too long. Oh God, it's so bad. And then Jimmy excuses himself to go panty brag to Ted. He grabs a celebratory bottle of wine, but finds himself lacking the means to open it. Ted, hey, Ted, where the hell's Parks grow? <laughs> Aw, oh, shit, yeah! Classic Jason kill. The twitching, the face hack. I love it. For this kill, they used another weapon with a piece cut out, then filmed the strike in reverse, which gives it that eerie motion. Jimmy's libido reviver Terry is the next one to go out. Literally, in this case, since Jason grabs her from outside the window, then chucks her from the second story. She flies through the air in slow motion and onto a station wagon that gets blown the fuck out. Hell yeah, that was awesome! The only thing I don't love is how Jason was all of a sudden up there right after killing Crispin Glover in the kitchen. And then after this kill, he's shown in the kitchen again. I won't call this teleportation, even though I do think he gains that power later on. Don't at me, Matt Pat. But Jason's pretty spatially inconsistent in this one, and I think it sometimes takes away from the suspense. Whatever though, as long as he's willing to put Ted out of his misery next. Dude's been guffawing at blue film reels for like six hours now. We gotta shut that shit down. Ted's eyes look red as shit here, so I'm guessing it's when Lawrence Monison unwisely decided to go method and actually get high before filming a scene. I'm a very paranoid stone person, so it was the worst, worst idea I could have ever done. Ted is killed in a way I've always enjoyed, the knife in his head slitting through the projector screen as he falls. The last pair of teens that need to be killed are Sarah and Doug, who I haven't even mentioned yet. Sarah's story is that she's a virgin who's nervous about going all the way, while Doug is literally not given a single tiny moment of development. It's surprising then that they still win me over as a fan, probably because they're both so gosh darn cute. The very pretty Peter Barton had been on the cover of some teen magazines before getting a starring role in a season of The Powers of Matthew Starr, which incidentally co-starred Friday 2's final girl, Amy Steele. Steele encouraged him to take the role, though he later complained about Zito not working with the actors. Sarah, also a cutie, was played by Barbara Howard, who does a great job with small moments in her performance. She also steadfastly refused to do nudity, so a body double was used in this steamy shower scene. After Sarah steps away to get ready for bed, Doug gets a new shower visitor, and this one plays rough. The murder of Doug is one of my low-key favorites of the series. We get full reveal Jason in it, and a super sick head crunch. Zeno wanted to reverse the stereotype of a woman victim in the shower, probably since he already did it very explicitly in The Prowler. So here, he has the pretty guy get killed all hot and wet. Ted White had to shove Barton's head hard against a padded surface before the shot switched out to a fake head that White then crushed beneath his hand. A blood tube running down Jason's sleeve provided all the red stuff. Sarah finds Doug's dead head hanging out in the shower door, then runs around wrapped up in the world's most secure towel, or at least until Jason goes to hell. Even though he was just upstairs in the bathroom, now Jason's somehow outside the front door, and he kills Sarah with an axe that lodges deep into her towel and chest. Trish and Rob get back to Tommy, then tell him to stay by himself as they and Gordon go next door. Right away, things uh, don't look good. I mean, Gordon's so unnerved, the poor good boy jumps through a frickin' window and runs away, never to return to the movie again. Here's some footage of Gordon's trainers getting him to do this stunt using his favorite toy, a stuffed rabbit. Aw, oh, what a good dog. Look at him jump through the window like that. Trish finds bad news and tells Rob they done fucked up. This house has got a Jason problem. Oh, and here he is now. I think he's killing you, Rob. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I thought. Although, can we really be sure about that? <laughs> All right, bud, I'll take your word for it. Rob's death was meant to be scary in contrast to the other more fun kills. I'll admit it is a little disturbing to hear him realize what's happening, but the repetition teeters into hilarity after a certain point. <laughs> Now that Rob's dead, Trish can begin her final girl circuit. Perhaps a double mint corpse to start things off? A little bit of Glover in the doorway. Oh, Jason is not interested in any Glovers in the doorway. Ouch. Trish's racer picks up a sidecar when she gets back home to TJ. So now both of them can enjoy a course classic, a body being flung through a window. This scene was choreographed to a beat, but Zito lied to Corey Feldman about when Jason would reappear. The window crash and grab took Feldman by complete surprise. Scared the sh-
shit out of me. That is real pants shitting terror on his face there. I'm not sure how seriously it scared the poor kid. Are you okay? Are you okay? No, no, I'm not okay. I was not okay. And I was not okay for quite a while. I can't help but feel like Ted White enjoyed doing that. Jason and Tommy weren't only adversaries on screen. The only person that I didn't get along with or was afraid of was Ted White. He was a mean little kid. Sounds like a culture clash between the old school White and the rowdy pubescent Feldman. He wasn't very well mannered. Now that was kind of hard for me to relate with because I wasn't real the cowboy type. That conflict is kind of hilarious to me, especially since White was fair as always and complimented Feldman's performance. As mean as he was, he was very good in the film. I liked him. Uh, I liked the way he did it. I liked the way he worked. I, I felt like he had the energy uh, of an adult as opposed to that of a kid. Jason busts his body into the house, throws a hammer at Trish's head, and eventually hacks his way through Tommy's door to say, Mister, clean up this room! Trish fights back, like any good final girl, putting a TV on Jason's head and later luring him out of the house so Tommy can have a chance to escape. She and Jason play cat and mouse all over La Casa de Horny Teen until she decides she's done playing this shit and good goddamn jumps out the window. Another slow motion falling stunt. I love it. I always feel bad when that boy bounces up and hits the stunt performer at the end. The back and forth between the two houses, so close together, makes for a great third act. The Jarvis house was a real house in Topanga Canyon that's been used in several other productions since then. Hormone Headquarters, on the other hand, was built by Friday's crew. An expensive line item, but one Zito pushed for and worth it for the chase setting. During his sister's race, Tommy has started to give himself a makeover after seeing what little boy Swamp Jason looked like in some news articles. Thanks for bringing those around, Rob. I really wish Jason hadn't killed you. <laughs> No, no, he's killed you, Rob. It's in the past now, man. Trish nearly whacks Jason when he tries to sneak up on her, then lands an awesome hit with the machete and splits his hand apart. God, I love this effect. It's one of my all-time favorites. Like many others in this movie, it was done by shooting the action in reverse. A very groany Jason eventually disarms Trish and knocks her down. But before he can kill her, Tommy runs downstairs and starts yelling at him. Jason! Great addition to the score here, with a theremin-sounding version of the Friday theme. Perfectly matches the mind games Tommy plays with Jason. The distraction gives Trish the chance to strike Jason, knocking off his mask and revealing a gnarly face, one modeled after his original Swamp Boy look. Tommy Jarvis then grabs the machete and hacks into Jason's head with it. The big man falls to the ground and is killed in another one of my absolute favorite effects. And yes, Jason dies here, especially after Tommy freaks out and goes ham with the machete. Killing Jason was always going to be a big deal, so it's a good thing Tom Savini had a kick-ass crew working with him. Kevin Yeager, who would later create the OG Chucky animatronic, Alec Gillis, who would go on to help make Goro in the first Mortal Kombat movie, and the late John Vulich, whose work we've also seen a lot on the Kill Count before. Vulich made the split head effect and did Grandpa's makeup in Texas Chainsaw 2, and he also did Bub the Zombie's makeup in Day of the Dead, where he worked under Savini again. It's Vulich's collection of masks we see in Tommy's room, and it was Vulich who suggested Jason be killed with a machete, after producers shot down Savini's initial idea. That one involved a microwave gadget Tommy would use to explode Jason's head. Such finality was embraced by Savini and Zito. It was my impression that there was never going to be another Friday the 13th. I was told that this is the last one. That's why the first machete plan was to split Jason's head open vertically, top to bottom. Or, barring that, saw a good-sized chunk of it off. But the producers, or the studio, or someone said to make it a less final death, cluing the filmmakers in that there'd likely be more Jasons in the future. In any case, this kill still kicks ass. The strike was filmed in reverse, as this great footage with Ted White shows, while the machete face slide was done with a puppet manipulated by lots of people, some operating the cable-controlled expressions, others pumping blood in to make it bleed. With the fake-out dream sequence cut, we jump to our final scene in the hospital. Trish wakes up and sees Tommy, then hugs him in a way to hide his bald cap wrinkles. Zito wanted Feldman to actually shave his head at first, but the kid's agents weren't about to allow that. Not with pilot season coming up. Feldman instead wore a bald cap every day for two weeks, and he cites that as the reason he was so sick and frustrated by the time they wrapped. He even says he was thinking of Zito while he was yelling, Die! Die! 
The movie ends with Tommy staring into the camera and looking disturbed, setting things up for a sequel to the final chapter, just in case. How many people got caught in the pages when Mancuso tried to close the book on Jason? Let's get to the numbers and count! 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 There were 14 kills in the final chapter, Jason and his 13 victims. All in all, there were 7 lady victims and 7 dudes, continuing Friday's trend of having mostly even pie charts. With a runtime of 91 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 6 and a half minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to the J-Man himself, Jason Voorhees. That character needed a spectacular death, and boy did they deliver. The old machete for lamest kill will go to Mama Jarvis, whose death was so lame it harkened back to Steve Christie's from the original. And that's it! Friday the 13th, the final chapter, was at first scheduled to be released in October 1984. But they rushed through post-production in an insanely short six weeks and finished in time for a very early release of Friday, April 13th. The film set a new opening weekend record for Paramount, and with that kind of success, obviously they'd make another film. I'll look at that next week, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. On the next Kill Count. Remember the 1660s? No. When people dress like pilgrims? You look like death. Sour fear. Flattering as ever. When they got high off fermented fruit. A good night to enjoy the fruits of the land. When science was a whittle baby. Who among you has welcomed the devil to union? Thanks to that last point, claims a witchcraft run amok whenever things stray from the normal and expected. And that can't be good for lesbians like Hannah Miller and Sarah Fear. I was not alive before now anyway. Fear Street Part 3, 1666, takes us back to the beginning of Shadyside and Sunnyvale. We see what really happened to the so-called witch Sarah Fear. She drinks the blood of virgins to keep her youth. And why Sunnyvale's good brothers seem to be playing life with cheat codes. Left, right, left, right, BA start. What? Then we fast forward back to 1994 so we can finish up this story and bring it all home. This is it. Yep. This weekend, watch the spectacular conclusion to the Fear Street Trilogy on Netflix. And this Sunday, unless there are any copyright issues... We are being punished. Tune into Dead Meat for the kill count. If they want a witch, I will give them a witch. Fear Street Part 3, 1666 can currently be watched on the pictured streaming platforms. Dead Meat always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before it's kill count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Thanks a lot for watching this kill count. I want to thank some patrons like Akari Blue, Spooky Boy 7703 Name, aka a.k.a. Soraka Most, Troy, Matthew Lee, Pantsernot, and Marcella Mon. Reminder, if you ever get the chance to meet Ted White, man. I mean, the guy is 95, so who knows how much longer we'll have him, but he's still really fun to talk to. Thanks, everyone. Be good people.